and welcome to the lecture number 54 that's 5-4. I'm very impressed of all of you that lasted through the first book and uh, the um, the depth uh, Ramam is going to be diving deeper and deeper into this uh, this discussion of the proofs. Remember, he ended the last book by bringing the proofs that the religious scholars of his day, the Islamic scholars, the Mutakalamun, used to prove the three most important philosophical principles that, number one, that God is one, number two, that God is not corporeal, and number three, that there was a creation and, and a creator, right? Um, so those were the three facts. Now, Rambam is going to tell us the uh, Aristotle's view, uh, or what would, what would correspond, what we would call today the scientific view, right? So um, a few words. Uh, so we're going to start book two. So we're in volume two in the, the bluish, greenish, I don't know what color this is, uh, one, it, and of the Pines version. I'm going to start, we're going to do the introduction. Um, and I always have uh, the Hebrew Kapach in front of me as well, because he has really great notes. And, um, and sometimes his translation is better. And sometimes the English translation is better. But anyway, um, there's, there's a few remarkable things that I want to point out before we even begin. But we have to understand that Ramam is about to embark on a summary of of physics of his day, right? He's trying to prove God, right? He's trying to prove those three important things that we just discussed and demonstrate what the proper Jewish view is. That's the end game here, is what the proper Jewish, what he considers the Torah view or the Jewish view or his view, okay? Um, and before he does that, he brings other religions and then he brings science. Now, he doesn't use the term science. Remember, Ramam used two uh, terms called physics and metaphysics, which he called Masa Bereshit and Masa Merkava. Masa Bereshit in Ramam's me mind means uh, physics and Masa Merkava is metaphysics. And that corresponds to Arist Aristotle's terms as well. Now, both in Aristotle's vision and, and the way Rambam un understood Aristotle, both of those things are actual physical scientific realities. It's not like today people think there's a physical world and a spiritual world, right? Ramam does, doesn't have such a, that same kind of differentiation. These are all actual, real, scientifically, in, in theory, somehow verifiable, real entities, actual things. So when Ramam refers to an intellect, right, it's, it's a force. It's something that's out there that does things that's actual and real. It's scientifically measurable. We might not have a, a something to measure it with it's just important to keep that in mind and the other thing is is that and you're is this is what's truly remarkable is that the concept or to, to the idea to the rambam of somebody staying that you should study only torah and not science is would be completely and utterly absurd to rambam right it's to say something like that would be just an absurd statement you cannot understand anything unless you know the world, unless you understand God's world, mass liberation. So Ramam is, has to give us these pointers, which he's about to give us, so that we can understand the process by which Aristotle came to his conclusions. And then we'll be able to understand how Rambam uh, argues with one of the main ones, that main conclusion being the idea that, uh, according to Aristotle, the world uh, is eternal. It's always been and always will be. And whereas according to the Rambam and according to the Torah, uh, there's there's a point of creation. The creator created the world ex nihilo yesh The um the so th that's where Ramam is going to lead to his disagreement with with my with um I'm sorry with uh, Aristotle. So now let, let so in this introduction um uh, he's going to summarize 25 slash 26 and you'll see why I say that uh, premises upon which Aristotle builds all of his conclusions. Okay. So, and it, it, this is a summary of these ideas, which um, according to Fine's notes on the bottom, there's no other person that had done this until Rambam's time. Rambam was very good and, and he loved to take lots and lots of things and crystallize them and list, okay, there's 10 things, right? So um, here he's gonna say 25. Now, um, 
Now we're about to learn some physics that are very, very different from the physics that any of us learned when we were in high school or college or 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 graduate school, whatever level of physics uh, education any of one listening here has. This is going to sound very different, but this at the time of the Ramam was physics. And I want to make one other point before I start, and that is is that even though this science is extremely outdated, I promise you that when as we see how the Rambam applies this science to the Torah. It will give you a tremendous amount of insight into how you should apply the science that you know to be true when you're when you're studying the Torah. And that's that's a really crucial point. And there are many places where Rambam indicates that he knows and understands that this science is not perfect and things might change. But his he dealt with being perplexed because he was dealing in a world that had the science of his day, which he it presents to us as the way things are. And we have similar challenges and we can use his methods and they're extremely relevant. So don't think that just because this is some Aristotelian idea that's been debunked a long time ago, therefore Maimonides has no relevance to us. You will find as we read through this, and that's why it's crucial to go through the pain of studying Aristotelian philosophical ideas, not because we really agree with these ideas and we know by now we our conception of the world scientifically is so, so dramatically different. But that's not the point. The point is we need, we need to see how Rambam dealt with, with this so that we can understand how we can deal with what we have in front of us today. I think that's a crucial point. Now that I made that point, let's, we're, we're going to go into this book and I'm, I, 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 I took some time to, um, to, uh, summarize each one of these premises that we're about to study in modern English terms that make that we can understand to try to simplify this. So, um, but in the, some of the paragraphs I'll, I'll read from the book and you'll see when I jump in and out, I'll tell you. So the premise is needed. Here we start. This is the introduction to book two, to part two. The premises needed for establishing the existence. Um, did, can, can everyone hear me okay? because I, I, my microphone was a little farther away than usual. Yeah. Uh, the premises needed for establishing the existence of the deity, may he be exalted. That's number one, right? In other words, that there is a creator. And for the demonstration that he is neither a body nor a force in a body, right? And so, and you'll understand as we go through Ramam why he said that neither a body nor a force within a body. And that he is one are 25. We need to understand 25 premises in order to understand those basic principles about God. And it's fascinating because these are the 25 principles of physics. It's like literally he sat down and said, today he sat down in class and said, I'm going to teach you um, Newtonian physics and, and we need these principles in order to understand God. That's what Ramam is saying. So try, let that sink in for a minute. Okay. So for Aristotle, um, all of which, all these 25 have been demonstrated without there being a doubt as to any point concerning them. You can rely on them, at least in Rambam's time. Obviously, since then, they have been disproven. But Rambam didn't see any reason why they should be disproven. They're basic. These are the premises. And, and the reason why he says that, is, and he's going to emphasize later, that he's not going to bother going through all the proofs and how the, because there's books and books and books. He'll refer us later. If you want to read about it, you can. But uh, that demonstrate each one of the premises. He's just saying the 25 conclusions that we have to accept this fact. So these are like the the Newtonian equations that are the bottom line of Newtonian physics, and then you'd have to use it in order to figure out problems. So these are the bottom line facts. Um, at, so, so, so for Aristotle and the peripat peripatetics after him that have come forward with a demonstration for every one of them, there's one premise that we will grant them, right? For, though, for through it, the objects of our quest will be demonstrated, I just will make clear, this premise is the eternity of the world. In other words, and I'm going to use that that premise the idea that the world has always been that the world wasn't created ex nihilo yesh me ayin right that premise i'm going to have to grant the philosophers just for argument's sake so assume for a moment that it's okay to express the idea that the world has always been and there wasn't a creator right assume that or not not well yeah that there wasn't a creator right assume that so that we can we can uh, we can go through aristotle's arguments and then I will show you later how I veer off that path and conclude that there is a creator. Okay, so it's important to do that. So, so the first premise. So, uh, so here we go. All right, and I, I'm going to try to simplify these things, and and uh, and I'm going to try to put them in 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 
terms that we can understand. The first premise is the existence of any infinite magnitude is impossible. So a magnitude is the way you measure something, right? So you can't say, uh, you know, you can say something is six feet tall, that's a measurement of height. You can say it's 200 pounds, that's a measurement of weight. You can say um, there's 7 million stars, that's a, a quantitative measurement. So anytime you measure anything, it's impossible for there to be infinite. It can't be infinitely tall. It has to end somewhere. That's the Aristotelian premise number one, okay? And of course, like Ramam tells us, there's books and books and books have been written by, by Aristotle and his, and his students to prove that. Premise number two, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> is uh, the existence of magnitudes of which the number is infinite as possible. So that means you can't have an infinite number of things, right? So if I tell you there's a table, I can tell you there's 100 tables, I can tell you there's 1,000 tables, but there can't be an infinite amount of tables. There can't be an infinite amount of stars or an infinite, it's impossible. It has to be a certain number. Third premise, okay? And the third premise is, is there can't be an infinite of causes and effects. What does that mean, right? In other words, if, I, if the carpenter is the one who caused my table to come to be, right? And the carpenter's parents caused the carpenter to come to be. And the carpenter's parents' parents caused them to come to be. And then let's say you want to go all the way back to evolution. Everything has a cause that made something come to be. It has to end somewhere. It can't keep going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. There has to be an end, a first cause. It can't go on forever. It causes an effect. So those are my own words. I, I think they're a lot easier to read than, than the way the Rambam worded it. The fourth premise, and this is an important idea here. And the fourth premise, remember, Rambam is teaching us physics now. So we're getting it. Uh, we're, we're, it's as if we just reround the clock a thousand years and we registered in Physics 101 in the University of uh, Cairo. And this is what we're learning. Okay. The fourth premise. Change exists in four categories. So there's four ways in which a thing can change. And um, so uh, the, the four ways are as follows. Something can change in, in substance, right? So, so the substance of something can change. You know, an animal could die and then it could rot and turn into uh, dirt, right? A substance can change, okay? Uh, it can change in, the, in quantity. And quantity means size or amount. Like you can have a person, the person can can be a child and then grow and be bigger. Or the person can gain weight and, and be fatter. The person can lose weight and be skinnier. A person can get older. He can grow a beard or whatever. He can change, right? So, so, so I'm sorry, quantity. The beard example wasn't a good one. But size or quantity, right? So it can change in quality, right? So the quality is something like it can go, it can have been cold and now it's hot. So that's a third type of change. And the fourth type of change is it can change in place. Like I can be sitting here now and I can be in my bed, in my bedroom tonight, right? So that's, I can change my place. I was now here and later on, I'm there. Okay, those are the four types of change. So remember that. There's only four ways things can change. Okay, Tom. Number five, I just turned the page to 236. The fifth premise, and this is interesting because this is going to pop up a bunch, is that every motion is a change and transition from potentiality to actuality. Every time something moves, right? Whatever it is that moved, it had the potential to be moved at some point, right? In other words, when I'm sitting here in this chair, I have the potential to get up and walk to my bedroom, right? And when I go walk to my bedroom, I have now changed that potential to something actual. I have now made that motion, right? So, and, and, and this is going to be an important principle that's going to pop up a lot. The sixth premise is another important group. And that is, is that there's four different types of motion, okay? And uh, the Rambam calls them, four, the four categories in the English translation I'm going to use now are, um, are essential, accidental, violent, and, and part. And it's fascinating because when we think, and I, I'm far from an expert in modern physics, I stopped after all I needed to study for the MCATs, and then I've forgotten all my physics since then. But it is fascinating if you have even a little bit of education in physics, how you can see how these ideas eventually gave birth to the problems that people like Isaac Newton and Einstein and for later physicists were dealing with. So number one is essential motion. Essential motion means the natural movement of an object. So the big, an example of that would be a stone falling right to the ground, right? It, that's the natural motion of the stone. Okay, before you know about the force of gravity, you think that that's, they were thought of that as an essential motion. It's just the natural motion that it does. That's what it does. 
The second type of motion is what Ramam calls accidental or mikre. In other words, it happened to something. So you have a rock, right? And I picked up the rock and I moved it from here to there, right? So I made it move or someone made it move or a, a, an animal comes by and, and pushes something or whatever, but something made a, a, an object move from here to there. And then there's what he calls violent motion. Violent motion is against natural motion. And that would be if I take a rock and I pick it up, right? So it's natural motion is to go down, but I lifted it and I pushed it up. That's violent motion. That's where a, a, a force takes something and pushes it in the wrong direction, so to speak. And then the fourth one is what the Rambam calls the, a, a part motion, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a partial motion, which is something that would give the idea to relative motion. And his example is of an item on a ship. So if we look at a ship and we see it moving on the water from here to there, right? So everything that's on the ship is also in motion. It's all moving, right? But now if I, if I take out my binoculars and I look at the ship and I see that on the ship, there's a sailor who's taking a box from one side of the ship and carrying it to the other side, right? So that is a Nowadays, we might use the term a relative motion because it was moving already, but now it's moving in, in relation to the ship that's also moving. And that's called what he calls part motion. So that is number six. I'm sorry, you guys. I know you thought you were coming to a Torah class and you're in a physics class, but that's just the way it goes. And, and like I explained in the beginning, in the Naraman, there is the, that difference didn't exist. This is knowledge. This is truth. You need to learn it. So here goes. Number seven, uh, and that is that anything that's um, changeable is divisible. So what does that mean? So Sarah of Kapach uh, and he explains this nicely in Hebrew. Um, he explains that that um, that that the, what what the 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 way um, the Aristotelians came up with this idea is because if let's say you have a, a you take a, a lump of I don't know whatever a, a person right and that person starts to change right the part it's, it's a gradual change so part of the body changes like let's say you heat up so the, it starts on the outside then it gets deeper and deeper or 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 you take an item and it starts to change in color or it starts to get cold right it starts somewhere and then it moves in or moves out or moves from top to bottom or right to left or whatever right so that means already that one part of it is changing before the other part so it's obviously divisible so anything that can change is divisible you can already hear where this is going because this is a physics principle, right? And and um, and you can hear how when Rambam is going to talk to us about God, how if God God cannot change and is not divisible, right? Because he cannot change, it's impossible for him to be divisible. That's that's just a little sliver. So I so you're understanding a little how we're going to jump from these physics ideas to ideas about God. Okay. Number eight uh, is the idea that um. That any that any motion that's accidental. Remember, there were four categories of motion, right? Uh, there was one motion that's essential, that's part and parcel of the thing, like the falling rock. And then there was what Ramam called accidental motion, which refers to when I pick up a rock and bring it from this room to that room. So that's accidental motion. Well, if that any accidental motion, it has to end at some point. It can't go on forever, right? This is similar to the idea that Ramam said he can't have anything that's infinite. Because if I pick up a rock from here and then I bring it there, then I bring it there, then I bring it there. At some point, it stops and I put it down, right? There has to be an end, right? And that end is what is when the person or force or thing or whatever it is that's making it move stops, right? The, the, the ninth principle, that's number eight. Number nine is that whoever it is or whatever it is that's doing the moving is also moving, right? So if I am moving the rock, I have to be moving, right? If the wind is blowing a leaf in the wind, the wind is moving too, right? It's impossible to conceive of the force that's making the movement uh, make something move without moving itself. That's another principle of Aristotelian physics. Number 10, um, any quality, okay? This is, uh, uh, it took me a few minutes to understand this, right? Either exists anything, if you look at someone's body or something that you see in front of you, whether a table, a desk, whatever it is, if it exists, right, any quality of it, it's, it's, it's red, it's hard, it's, it has a certain shape, right? It that quality exists because of the body that it exists in, right? If you say it's hard, 
it's only hard because it's 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 it, the table is hard, right? The ta table has it wouldn't make sense to if there was no table to say that it was hard, right? It's only hard because there's a table that's hard, right? So it, so every quality exists to do the body or it is the force that makes the body exist. And now here's where um uh well actually we're going to come back to this one a little bit more later when we talk about matter and form, which is the final one of the 25, which is real important. So I'm going to hold off a little bit of discussion on this. When I talk about what, what when we talk about um, a chomer and sura, which is the Hebrew terms for matter and form, which is the Aristotelian idea, I think it's called a hylo, uh, hylomorphism, is the Aristotelian idea of matter and form. I'll talk about what that means, because that pops up in Torah literature all the time. And it's so different from our concepts of science that it's important for us to understand what they were thinking. So that when we read this in books, any book, especially in the Rambam, we will understand what they're talking about. Because um, anyway, but we'll get back to that. So number 11, um, the 11th premise. I'm now on the bottom of page 236. The 11th premise is that qualities that exist because of the body are also divisible, right? Because if I say this bottle, this, body, this, this table is brown, right? It's divisible because if I cut the table in half, now I have two tables that are brown. There's a brown table over here and there's a, or a brown half a table over here and a brown half a table over there, right? So however, the quality that make the body exist is not divisible. What's the quality? It's the intellect or the soul, which according to Ramam is synonymous, right? The intellect makes the body be. That cannot be divided. The, the, it's inconceivable that there's one Saul Weinreb's brain over here and another half Saul Weinreb's brain. It doesn't work that way. The intellect is one unified thing. Okay. You, now, remember, you can agree or disagree with these ideas, right? That's not the point. The point is that in Rambam's day, th these were the basics of physics. This was the 25 principles that everybody had to learn when they wanted to know physics. This is what you have to learn. Number 12. Any force that exists within a body, so let it be a soul or something that animates me or you or anyone here, right? It's finite because it's limited by my body. It's only in me, right? It's not in you or you or you. It's not walking out of my house down the road. It's in me and that's it. That's all it is, okay? And we'll see later, whatever, if the body ceases to exist, well, then maybe it might be different. But right now it's here. It, 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 so it's finite, just like my body is finite. Now, uh, no motion, that's, that's number 12. Number 13, no motion can be continuous unless it is circular, okay? That's another principle of Aristotelian physics. It, because if you think about anything that has to turn a corner, like that's not that it ends, right? It ends, it changes direction, et cetera. But something that goes around in circles can continue on and on. So if you have motion that's continuous and doesn't stop, it has to be circular motion. Now you can understand already how that's gonna help in understanding the motions of the spheres which we touched on a bit a few times, and we're going to touch on a lot more as we go through this. Um, if anyone wants to stop me and ask questions about these things, please do so. But uh, we're trying. We, let's go through this. The, th the number fifteen is um is and I'm now on page two thirty seven in the Pines. The fifteenth premise is as follows, and that is is that motion and, and time are necessary for each other, and this is really important. We're going to see later, and, and Rama mentioned this a little before that the um. You know that the concept of time didn't exist before creation because time only exists in relative to motion, right? If there's no motion, there's no time. If there's no time, there's no motion. And this is something that just made me think of one of the few Newtonian equations that I still remember from physics 101 in college, and that is that that uh, distance equals velocity times time, right? So you can't. They're both in that equation. You can't conceive of that kind of motion without time. Now maybe in modern physics and uh, theoretical physics it might be different, but in the, the physics that we see every day, those rules, those Newtonian rules still hold true. And that and that is the idea that you cannot conceive of motion without time. So if there is no motion, right, there is no, then there is no time. And if there's no time, there's no motion. Fine. That's number 15. Number 16, the 16th Aristotelian idea. And that is that in anything that, um, Remember before I said that my soul is finite as long as it's in me, right? Any, 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 any force that animates or brings life to something or makes something exist is, is limited to that thing, right? However, an intellect 
cannot be counted or divided into parts unless it is associated with a either a body, right? So you can count my intellect and your intellect and your intellect, right? Because we're separate, we're separate people. But if we're not, right? It, like if it's not associated with the body, you can't count them, right? There's no numbers. There isn't 162,000 souls waiting in a certain box that God has in heaven or something. It doesn't work. You can't count them that way, right? And, uh, or you can also count the things that those forces cause, right? You can say it caused two thunderstorms or it caused 25 people to be born, but you can't say that it, uh, you can't count that. Fine. That's pre principle number 16, a principle of physics. Okay. I, I almost, I want to jump to 25, like now already. Um, I, I well, but I don't, I won't, I'll go in the Rambam's order. Um, because matter and form is it's so important for us to understand because we really need to screw on our heads when when we learn almost anything from a Hasidic safer to uh to uh to uh, like anything Sura, homer and Sura, they keep popping up and and to a modern mind we don't even understand what they're talking about and i want to explain it to you so that anytime you open a book the, a, a medieval book you'll know what they're talking about okay but we'll get there so the next thing is Everything that moves must have a mover, right? Nothing can move on its own, right? The Ramam has a quote here from um, from the, uh, no, he quotes it later. Um, I'm trying to remember where. Oh, it's late. He quotes it in a later one. But, but basically, matter does not move itself. It's later when we talk about matter and form. It's a quote from Aristotle. Matter cannot move itself, right? If matter is moving, there must be something moving it, right? Now, um, so, so, um, so, and this is true for all of the types of motion that we said before, even essential motion. Like we talked, essential motion meant the motion that they viewed as natural motion, like a, a rock falling, right? There still is a force that's making it happen. Something is making that motion happen. Right. And, and Raman points out, if you have an animal that's walking down, people try to disprove this notion. What do you mean? Nothing's moving that animal. No, there is within the animal. There is a soul that makes that animal move within you and me. There is a force of life that says, I want to step outside. I want to go for a walk. Right. So so the Rama makes it clear that that's not a disproof uh, because. Because even within us, there's a force that makes us move. It looks like I'm moving myself, but it's really a force within me that's making my body move. So there's always something making something move. That's number 17. Number 18, anything that changes, right, from potential to actual. Remember, he talked about that in motion, right? If you have something that's, 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 that's sitting here, it's a potential. It could be over there. It's just not there yet. When I pick it up and bring it there, that I brought it from potential to actual. So if it changes, it must have some outside force that made it happen. It must have me. I decided to pick up the rock and put it over there, right? If I didn't make that decision and do it, it would still be here, right? So anything, something changes from potential to actual, something has to make that happen. All right. You can start trying to imagine in your mind how all these premises are going to play when, and when Ramam discusses God and, and, and it helps us understand what he means when he discusses concepts of God and so on. But anyway, but, and then that's really, that is the point. That's why Ramam is doing, saying all of this so that he under, so that you understand that we understand, you know, what he's talking about, what his language he's using, what he means. So number 19, um, whenever, if something requires a cause for something to exist, right? Such as a soul in a body, which is an example that Ramam gives himself. When you take the cause away, then the thing ceases to exist. So you take the soul out of the person, whatever that force that animates a person is, I'm calling it a soul. But remember how Ramam conceives of that and how other thinkers and philosophers over the ages and Judaism for sure think of it is very different, but that's not the point. Whatever you're going to call that force that animates me, if God forbid it, it left me, I wouldn't be anymore, right? That would be true for all of us. Number 20. And this is that anything that of necessity has to exist on its own. In other words, if you're going to find me something, right? And I bet you guys can figure out right away what this something is or who this something is, that that of necessity exists on its own without anything making it exist. Well, then there has to be no causer that makes that entity exist. Now, guess who that is? That could only be God, right? So if I tell you that 
got, you know, that if I show you that God exists, right, then you can't tell me that there's something out there that made God exist, right? Because if God has to exist, if logically he has to exist, then um, it's impossible that anything made him happen. Because if you apply the premise from before, right, um, there has to be an outside cause. And you take the outside cause away, it ceases to exist. But if something exists without an outside cause, then, then, then it, there can't be an outside cause. All right. Anyway, so that's, that's important. Fine. So that's number 20. Number 21. If something is made, and I'm now on page 238. And if you see that I'm using very different language than Rambam, you, that, that's because I am, because I'm trying to make it translatable in, in, in our century. Uh, so, I have a quick so last, sorry? This last proposition, where yes. you said, well, God is the obvious, uh, the 20th premise. Is there anything other than God that can possibly uh, relate to uh, this 20th? I mean, uh, the God is in, the in, theory, in theory, you might come up with something, but in, act in the actual world, no. Okay. You know, uh, there is nothing else um, that has to exist, right? That there, there has to be, right? Um, and there is nothing else that has no cause causing it, right? And that's the basic Aristotelian idea, which Ramam absolutely subscribes, subscribes to, and that is the, that God is the prime mover. He's the one that makes the whole thing go around, right? Um, now, 21, if something is made of more than two things, like if you find me something and you say, oh, that, oh, that's made out of, uh, I don't know, whatever, if I just had pasta and mushrooms. That's made out of pasta and mushrooms, okay? So, so you can't, and so it has to be, right? The cause of the pasta and mushrooms are because pasta got together with mushrooms, right? And, and I mixed them together and I cooked them and I ate them, right? But, um, but if, if, if you, if, if, so, so in other words, the, the cause of that's existence. So if anything that you can describe with two descriptors and say, so if you're going to say, if I asked you, and this is crucial because we learned this together in depth, the idea of Rambam's idea that you cannot give attributes to God. If you told me, describe God to me, and you said, oh, well, he's got 13 attributes. He's, 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 he's good, he's kind, he's empathetic, he's patient. Whoops, you just committed a major Maimonidean sin, right? Because, because you're describing that God has this character and this character, and you put all those together and you get God, whoa, big problem, red flag, right? Because you just described, now you just said all of these components make up God, but that can't be, right? Because that means that if you pull those opponents apart, you don't have God anymore. That's a logical impossibility. And this is fascinating because it's a, based on principles of modern, and I say modern physics, I mean in Rambam's day, it's impossible to describe God with attributes. He just used a scientific principle to explain that. So as we go through this, you'll understand how profound some of these things are, that he's using science to explain these ideas. That's number 21. Number 22, I know I jumped the gun a little bit because Raman here is just laying out the principles and he's not telling us how he's going to use those principles later that we're going to get to. But I can't help myself if I jump ahead a little bit because I want to give you a little flavor of what why he's doing this because otherwise it would be really dry. <laughs> All right. But anyway, number 22, every single physical thing in the universe is made of parts. So this is where, Ram, remember, uh, Jeff, you asked before about if, um, if, uh, you know, if there's anything else but God, well, this principle is that there is nothing else but God, because everything in the physical universe, how do you describe, find anything? Well, it's made of this, this, and this, right? It, it, my salt is made out of sodium and chloride. It gets together, it becomes sodium chloride, and I call it salt, right? The book that's in front of me, it's made out of some paper and some ink and some binding and blah, 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 right? So, so everything we know, everything that exists, the star is made out of this chemical and that kind of this this element that element everything we see in the entire universe is made of stuff and you describe what stuff it's made of so therefore there's nothing in this universe that can be that's in, at all, even remotely comparable to god number 23 um is uh, i'm gonna read from the text here for a minute because here that i, I like uh, the this text I, i'm not using my own the 23rd premise on the bottom of 238 it is possible for whatsoever is in potentia and in whose essence there is a certain possibility not to exist and act to at a certain time. So that means that, that if you find something that can potentially be, right, it's possible for it to remain in potentia, right? So if I take a, a seed, Kapak's example is a date seed, 
you can plant it and it has the potential if you water it properly and you give it the right amount of sun that it'll grow into a date palm, right? Or if you have a, a chunk of iron and, and if you melt it properly and you put it in a form and you bang it down and you sharpen it, you could turn it into a sword, right? But, but it's if you don't do all that stuff, then it'll just stay the way it is, right? So you can have a chunk of matter and if nobody does anything to it, it'll just stay a chunk of matter, right? But if you do something to it, then you can make it into something else. Okay. And number 24 is whatever, whatsoever is the top of page 239, excuse me, whatsoever is something in potentia is necessarily endowed with matter. For possibility, there's always a matter. In other words, if I tell you that there's a potential sword somewhere, right? Right. That's because somewhere in the world, there's a mine. And in that mine, there's iron. And if somebody goes and mines the iron and takes it out and puts it through whatever you got to do to make it into a sword, right? There's a potential sword somewhere in the world, right? But I can't tell you there's a potential sword if there's no matter in the entire universe with which to make a sword. In other words, it doesn't just come from poof, right? If there's potential out there, it's because there's stuff, there's actual matter, there's actual stuff somewhere. Okay, now is number 25. And this I'm gonna explain in my own words, and that's the idea of matter and form. Now, what is matter and form? So matter, I think we understand what matter. Matter is stuff, right? Now today, you and I hopefully remember, you know, the, the, the periodic table of the elements. So we have at least a basic idea, right? But so we know all matter is made up of elements, right? Now, obviously, they had a different understanding. They had, they had total, they also had elements, you know, we, which we learned earlier: earth, fire, water, and wind. But um, but um, the idea is though is that um, the, but that's matter. So everything is made of stuff. What form? Form is the thing or the force that makes the matter assemble into the shape that it's in. Okay. So it's almost it's this is it's it, it's bordering on something that's spiritual. But remember. Rambam and Aristotle didn't differentiate but in the way that you and I sometimes think. We think about spiritual things as being on a different plane. A different, that's not the way that everything is scientific. Everything has laws and rules and we can understand it. And you have to, you have to think that way. So there's a force that turns me into me, right? That makes the Saul Weinreb form and makes me me, right? That force, whatever it is, that's surah, that's form, okay? So this is a, a, it's almost the things that we sometimes might think border on spiritual or whatever. And those, in, in this idea and the way Aristotle explained the world and the way Ramam is explaining the world, everything has such a tsura. There is a tsura, there is a force that makes the table a table, right? What gives wood the qualities that make wood wood? It's the tsura of wood. It's this force that makes wood have woodness to it and so on and so forth. So keep that in mind whenever you have, whenever you learn from someone who's writing in medieval times. So, so up to somewhere, I don't know, in, in, the, in the Sfarim, it's somewhere in the 20th century that a lot of the writers of Sfarim uh, got this idea. But in the in secular world, it's a little earlier than that, right? But when you see Homer and Surah, understand what it means, okay? Homer means the, the stuff, right? And Sura means that that whatever it is that causes that stuff to assemble into the shape and form that we see with our eyes, with the functions and abilities that it, that it has. So now that we said this, um, um, so now you can understand going back before when the Ramam talked about every, every, every item that goes from potential to actual, right? There's something that's making it happen. What is that something? That something is the tsura, right? The tsura, the form, the force that forms it into that. Now, those forces could be a combination of all kinds of forces in the world. And Raman is going to explain how the motions of the spheres and the planets and they all mix and how the how the natural tendency for fire to go up and and uh, matter and soil to go down. It's that they all mix and get mixed in such a way that gives tsura to the objects. OK, which is a scientific principle. So now that we got this, now I'm going to go back to. Th so those are the 25 premises. And he's about to talk about number 26. Because number 26 is the big controversial one. And this is where, this is the famous place where Rambam, as much as he loved Aristotle, there was one thing that he disagreed on. And that's like one of the most important parts of this entire book. And that is the eternity of the world. So uh, we're going to be talking about that 
a lot for a while, but here goes. So it was just a tiny little intro. So the Ramam says, and I'm reading on 239 from the Pines English translation, okay? Of the 25 premises that I have put before you in the form of a preface, some are easy. Some become manifest with little reflection. Anyone, you and I, we might not be metaphysicists or physicists, but you can figure them out, right? Like the, what I told you about motion and time. That makes sense to us, right? You, you can figure that out. You know, uh, it's pretty basic. Um, others require a number of demonstrations and premises leading up to them. Others, you, there's books written on. However, all of them have been given, to, trust me, they have been given demonstrations as to which no doubt is possible. I'm telling you these are proven, right? There's no re reason you can question these ideas. Trust me, re you can, with regard to some of them, you can look in the book of Acroasis and its commentaries. You can look in the book of Metaphysics and its commentary. There's, there's books and books on the books. Just go and look at um, uh, the, the book of Acroasis is referring to the what's nowadays. If you, if you go online, you can look for Aristotle's book, which is titled Physics. That would be the book he's referring to. Okay. I've already made it known to you. And remember, you here is the guy he's the writing this safer for, his student. Remember, all the way back in the beginning, he had a student he's writing this book to. Um, that the purpose of this treatise is not to transcribe the books of philosophy. I'm not sitting here and writing you a whole library of philosophy books to, to back up all these ideas and to explain the most remote of the premises, but to mention the proximate ones that are required for our purpose. Sorry if I'm paraphrasing a little bit. However, I shall add to the premises mentioned one more that affirms as necessary the eternity of the world. Aristotle really has a number 26. And that is, he says that the world has always been. The world is eternal. It has always been and always will be, right? So what we see is what we get. And it's what we, if you walk back 10 million years, you would have seen the same thing, okay? So um, Aristotle deemed it to be correct and the most fitting to be believed. We shall grant him this premise by way of a hypothesis. In order, to, uh, in order that the clarification of that which we intended to make clear should be achieved. I'm going to accept it for argument's sake as we go through the further discussions, his idea that the world is eternal, right? This premise, which among, I'm sorry, which among them is the 26th, which is the 26th out of the, out of the 25 that I mentioned, um, that time and movement are eternal, perpetual, existing in actual. In other words, they're, they're not potential, but all this motion that we see is the same motion that's going to keep on going, and it's the same motion that always been going. Hence, it follows of necessity, in his opinion, that there is a body moving with an eternal movement. And this is the fifth body, right? And um, in other words, if, if, if it's always moving, then there is something that's always moving it, right? Remember, we said that rule, the premise was that anything that moves must have something moving it, right? For this reason, he says that heaven is not subject to generation and corruption. That's why what Aristotle calls the fifth body, right, which is the, the, um, the uh, uh, God, the deity, right, the one that's moving it all, right, can't be something that changes because it's always going the same, not like everything else in the world that has to stop at some point, right? But the, the God is always going round and round and round, right? Because remember, round is the continuous motion, which is why when you look up at the sky in their mind, everything's always going round, right? Um, so um, for according to him, movement is not subject to generation and corruption. For he says that every movement is necessarily preceded by another movement, either of the same species or, or, or of another species. And that what is thought with regard to living beings, that their local movement is not preceded by another is not correct. Right? For the cause of their movement after rest goes back finally to things calling for this local movement. Wait, I'm sorry. I skipped. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't skip anything. I apologize. Um, these things being either an alteration of temperament necessitating the desire to seek. But I'm going to skip a little bit here. Accordingly, any one of these three factors sets the living being in motion. And every one of them is necessitated by other movements. So, you know, when a, when a, when a, when a person moves, and I, I, I mentioned this before, that People argue about, you know, uh, uh, what do you mean everything needs something else to make it move? What about a person who moves? Well, no, a person moves because something within him decides, I'm hungry, I'm going to go eat. Or there's a lion chasing me, I need to run, right? So some, something makes happen, makes you do something, but it's inside you, there's a, something that makes that happen. So similarly, he says that in the case of everything that comes about in time, the possibility of it's coming about precedes in time, it's coming about. So 
So from this, there follow necessarily several points that I will to validate this premise. So um, according to this premise, a finite moving object moves upon a finite distance an infinite number of times, going back over the same distance in a circle. So you have an object, which we said can't be infinite. It has to be a certain amount. It can't be infinitely large, which moves a certain amount of distance because we said that it's nothing, you know, but it does it over and over and over again. It just keeps going round and round and round and round. Now, this is impossible except in circular movement, as is demonstrated in the 13th of the premise. So now, this is the premise, and I'm reading the second paragraph, and this is going to end this chapter in today's lecture. This is the premise that Aristotle constantly wishes to establish as true. He's constantly pushing for the eternity of the world. And this is obviously the big thing that bothers Rama. We get to, I think it's chapter 13, where he just says, even though you can argue and argue with Aristotle back and forth, and I can prove, and he can prove, and they can prove, and we all can sit and argue. The Rambam says, I, it's not true. I know Aristotle is wrong because nothing would make sense. Like the whole purpose of the world just wouldn't make sense if everything just kept on going, if it was eternal. There had to have been a creation that created everything with a reason. And it, 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 when the Rambam says that, it's, he says it with such a power of passion. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you again, I'm giving, uh, I'm making spoilers, right? But um, it's like I, I can scientifically accept that maybe he's right, but I can't accept that he's right because it just the whole world would have no purpose if that was the case. Is, is essentially what Rama was going to eventually argue. In other words, he's he's going to and he's going to demonstrate a very a very rational and scientifically valid. And when I say scientific matter, I mean according to Rama and his science approach that demonstrates that it doesn't have to be eternal, right? But 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 then he'll admit that I don't know if I'm right or he's right, but I know I'm right because of, of what I just said, because it has to be, right? And we'll get there, right? Because he says the entire Torah would make no sense otherwise, right? Like, you know, why why should we be good? Why should we do anything? It just wouldn't make any sense. So the, the premise in question is rather, in his opinion, the most fitting and the most pro probable. No, I'm sorry. Now, now to me, I skipped the sentence that's important. The second sentence in the second paragraph on 240. To me, it seems that he does not affirm categorically that the arguments he puts forward in favor constitute the demonstration. This is amazing. Rama is saying, when I read Aristotle, I think that he himself realized that he can't prove 100% that the world is internal, right? And he realized, he realized that all the other premises he can prove. But this one, I think Aristotle himself knew, because Rama wants to say, you know, he doesn't want to go up against Aristotle if Aristotle was absolutely certain. So he'd rather say that Aristotle himself wasn't even certain. The, uh, however, his followers and commentaries on his book, they thought that Aristotle thought that he meant it for sure. In other words, that this was an absolute principle. I know, Ramam says, I admit that that's what Aristotle wrote and that's what he held. But I also think that Aristotle realized that his arguments weren't solid. And we're going to get into that into a lot more detail. On the other hand, the Mutakalam and the guys that we learned last week, right, they say um, they desire to establish that it is impossible. Right? They want to prove that he's completely wrong. Right? And Ramam already dealt with their proofs and knocked them all out the window. Right? That's what he did. They say there can be no mental representation of the coming about in succession of an infinite number of things occurring time. It can't just keep on going and going and going and going forever. The strength of their argument is that it constitutes, in their opinion, at first intelligible. But to me, it seems that the premise in question is possible. In other words, it could be that Aristotle is right. Right? That is... Um, neither necessary as affirmed by the commentaries of the writings of Aristotle. In other words, it's not absolutely proven like the people that follow Aristotle claim. But on the other hand, it is also not impossible like the Mutakalman claims. So Aristotle's logic could be right, but it's not. It is not now the purpose to explain the arguments of Aristotle or to raise our doubts or to explain my opinion of the cre creation because we're going to do that, right? But the purpose at this point is to circumscribe the premises that we need for our three problems. Remember our three problems, that there is a creator and there was a creation. That's one, right? The fact, once you say there's a yesh and it means that there was a, there was a being, namely a God, a, a deity that made it happen. Number two, that he is one. And number three, that he does not have a body, okay? So I just wanted to lay out the premises so that we can use them to prove that, to th prove those three ideas after first having set forth these premises and having agreed to take them as granted. Now that you can take these as granted, I shall set out explaining what necessarily follows from them. And now he's going to use those to explain all kinds of things. 
So that is the introduction to chapter two. And I, I, I'm, as we go through the, the, the Ramam's proofs and stuff, the, these, these ideas, these premises will start becoming second nature to you. They'll start becoming like, like, like facts, right? Whether, whether they're scientifically correct modern days. And, and, I, and as we go through it, I really I want you to, to think hard um, as you start developing and understanding the way the Ramam takes physics, science, and uses it as he tries to navigate his way to establish basic Torah principles, right? How we should deal the same way today. In other words, obviously, I'm not going to talk to you about, you know, the, the, these 25 principles today. We're, we have very different science. But the method that he uses is extremely relevant and extremely important. So I'm going to stop here and open the floor for questions. But you got to unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a simple way. If, if we go back to number three. Okay. Third premise. And we're starting with an assumption that um, uh, the, of the eternity of the world. He yeah. says the existence of causes and effects of which the number of infinite is impossible. And it goes, right. on. for example, there's a particular en en intellect that causes, causes, causes second intellect, causes the second, third, and third, fourth, and so on to infinity. Right. Well, how is, doesn't this undermine the idea of the eternity of the world? Because what's the cause of the world, unless you, I mean, how do you dig out of that? Um, well, well, I mean, both according to Aristotle and according to Rambam, that remains true. Because all the, the cause and effect goes back, 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 until right. you get to God, right? And both according to Aristotle and Rambam, God is the end or the beginning, depending on which direction you're going, right? Well, so... It's not infinite. But um, what's, what's the cause of God? Nothing, because God is the only thing that has to exist on his own. Okay. So th there is no cause for God, there which is, no is why, God. right. And, and God is the only entity for which there is no cause. Okay. Okay. Sort of... okay. That's good that you brought that up because it helped bring out that idea because it's important to remember. Any other comments? Would you, if there aren't, no, go ahead, please. Would you say that, um, take an example from modern chemistry, organic chemistry. Okay. You can create virtually an unlimited number of, uh, of elements. Not, not that that has been done yet, but there, I'm sure hundreds or thousands of new ones are created every, every year yeah. uh, by organic chemists. Um, does that... Well, I don't know if they take eight, that many more elements. I think maybe more molecules, no, no, but compounds. elements. The compounds. I mean, compounds, yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, does that, does... But it's not technically infinite. I mean, it's probably gazillion, I don't know, billions to billions uh, to, to billions of, you know, but but uh, of, of, of different possibilities, but, but it's not infinite, right? I mean... I don't. I don't know how the number is extremely large. You can just add an, add another carbon onto the end of of, uh, of of a of a polymer and create a new element. So basically, it's just like well, at some point you'll run out of carbons in the world and the okay. universe, right? I don't know. I don't know how many carbon molecules there is in the entire universe. Yeah, a number that we can't even comprehend. But at some point you'll get to all. You'll be done with all the carbons, and that'll be it. <laughs> You know. Okay. Yeah, there is a finite number of. of right, right. Yeah, I mean, I exactly. We, I don't, so I talk to astrophysicists might be able to give you an estimate, <laughs> but it's a big number. It won't fit in, on your page. That's for sure. But yeah. anyway, any other questions or comments or observations? Is that the entire second volume? Is the entire volume we're looking at? Uh, uh, a, a, a derivative of the, these 25 principles or do we get to other topics in here? Oh, we're going to, he's going to be, he, Ramam in his usual way bounces around, as you know, right? He does that all the time. Okay. He's, that's, he deliberately does that, you know, sure. as soon as he gets to some, like something will get like really juicy and then all of a sudden he'll say it like in a cryptic, you know, esoteric way. And then all of a sudden he'll jump off to another side. It's, as we've seen until now, you know, but remember these things. I, I, it seems, I, it, it might seem a little straight, uh, difficult now, but it won't, you'll see. As we go through it, 
you'll start seeing how he thinks and, and you'll start learning, you know, how, how he would apply any knowledge to, and, 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 and how, and how he would reconcile differences that seem to happen when you start learning the Torah. Right. And that, that's really what the purpose of this book is. The Raman was dealing with, this was his physics, right. And he was trying to figure out how this meshes, how this jives with Torah. And, and to him, it's not, it's not considered a conflict. He needs to, the truth needs to be one unified thing. It all has to make sense together. And that's what he's trying to do here. And he's going to teach us how to do it. And you'll see. If you stick with it, it it'll work. You'll get it. Okay? All yes. right. Have, Great have class. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Yes, Looking forward you. to next week. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.